I will go ahead and get started. It looks like people are catching on to the slide here um, to share your name and where you're tuning in from in the chat. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're excited to share this evening with you to share, share around these topics on forest farming. I'm Katie Trazo. I'm the coordinator of the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition. I also coordinate the Virginia Tech Catawba Sustainability Center Forest Herb Network. And I'm just kicking us off tonight on behalf of our partners, including Penn State and NC State, and of course, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. So we're really excited to have you here today. Again, I invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat so we can see see who's here with us in the space. And I will just get us started with some technical logistics. First, you might notice that you don't have a video and you can't uh, share audio either. And that's just normal because this is a Zoom webinar and not a Zoom meeting. So it's more of a one-way stream we'll be sharing with you tonight. But the way you can interact with us this evening is through the chat feature. You're welcome to share comments there. And also in the Q&A feature, is where you can add any questions you have for the speaker and panelists this evening when we have our open Q&A session. So those are two, two ways you can interact tonight. We also wanna let you know that this event is live captioned and I'll be enabling those here in a minute. That'll be an option that will appear in the lower panel of your Zoom screen and you can click the CC button and you can have subtitles added. And we'll put that in the chat too for those directions once it gets started. And let's see what's next. We wanted to let you also know that these sessions are being recorded and they will be archived on the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition website. So we will, we have a list of folks who are attending tonight and we'll make sure that you get that link once it's ready. It might take a week or a little bit more to get it up there. And finally, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you're welcome to reach out to me in the chat, Katie Trazo. Also, you're welcome to email me if that's um, necessary at ketrazo at vt.edu. And we have um, Margaret Bloomquist from NC State playing backup over here. So she's putting some messages in the chat here. So thanks so much, Margaret, for helping host this evening. So this is our first session of the Forest Farming in Focus series, which is a a series of webinars this winter, five of them focused on different non-timber forest products and ways that we can go about forest farming them. And it's really a deeper dive into these topics. And so we'll have expert speakers and panelists who've developed their skills and learning and have been practicing for many years on these, um, growing these products. So we also wanna let you know that on the ABFFC website, there are intro learning modules too to supplement if anybody is needing some more of the 101 learning. So that's available. And Margaret, um, if you're up for putting that in the chat, just that link, just so folks know where to get it. Um, and so that's, that's available for this webinar and also for all the other topics, we'll be populating those intro learning modules and then you're welcome to tune in for the additional crops as well. So our first topic this evening is Tree Saps and Syrups 201, a deeper tap into species, processes, and products. And we have a really great lineup this evening. Um, first, we have Kate Photos, who's gonna be doing a 201 presentation. And then we have three farmers who are gonna be doing, um, just having a moderated panel that Kate's gonna be leading. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions from the audience. And I will introduce Kate, and then Kate will introduce our speakers. Um, so Kate Photos is a field coordinator at Appalachian Sustainable Development. Is that right? It's Future, future Generations. Yeah, I'm at Future Generations University. We uh, often partner with Appalachian Sustainable Development. Thank you, Kate. Typo here. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. So Kate, Kate graduated from Colby College with a degree in environmental science and conservation biology. She began her work in maple syrup researching alternative tree syrups such as sycamore and walnut. And in that first year, she also ran a statewide maple education program for public schools across West Virginia. She's now expanded her scope of work to include producer coaching and public education for maple syrup production across the Appalachian range. Outside of the maple realm, Kate, Kate has developed a deep love of the outdoors and has worked as a long distance canoe guide 
and a competitive lumberjack and an arborist. So um, thanks so much, Kate, for coming and for hosting this evening. I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Katie, for that awesome introduction. Um, yes, I do wanna continue to share my own screen. Here we go. Let me make this full screen for everybody. Um, yeah, so as Katie said, my name is Kate Photos, and tonight we're talking about tree saps and syrups, and we're looking a little bit deeper than what you might have already know about syrup production, right? So we're going to look into why maples to begin with, and then we'll kind of branch out into a little bit of what else is out there. So here's the agenda for my chat. Um, I want to do some introductions of our lovely panelists tonight, and I also am then going to talk about the science behind sap flow, then get into the species we use, and then other products that you might have seen on the market that are often sold alongside tree syrups. So a little bit about future generations in it, the Appalachian program and maple initiatives. I, I'm not a solo person. Uh, I work with a great team of people um, and we do a lot of extension research and education as well as some marketing for maple syrup. Um, it, I'll give you y'all some um, contact information, but if you see that little um, website in the corner of the slide, that's where you can find a lot about what we're doing here in West Virginia and across the Appalachian region. Um, I just wanna point out Scruff. I think he's the most important team member. He works as our campus security dog. So he's a good one. Um, so tonight we have four lovely, I mean, three, I guess if I count myself, four lovely female syrup producers, uh, three of which are based in West Virginia, including, whoops, sorry, myself, um, and one of which is based in Highland County, Virginia. Um, so the first is Frostmore Farm, um, and this is Rachel Taylor. Frostmore Farm started as a hobby in 2011. They grew to 370 buckets before jumping to commercial in 2015. Frostmore Farms now has 11,000 taps on site and they actually partner with um, the Pelham, uh, Pocahontas County High School Forestry class and that class has 100 taps that they tap and manage. And then a fun fact about their farm is Adam, Rachel's husband, came up with the name for the farm because they're uh, almost halfway between Dunmore, West Virginia and Frost, West Virginia, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I was about to say, Rachel has also been deeply involved in our West Virginia Maple Syrup Producers Association over the years um, and has held a couple different roles. Uh, if you're looking to find out more about them, they have a great Facebook page. And if you're ever halfway between Frost and Dunmore, you need to stop by their little roadside stand. They always have some great goodies in there. We, from Highland County, we have Laurel Fork Sap Suckers and Missy Moyers Jarls. Um, the Laurel Fork Sap Suckers began making maple syrup in 2009 with 25 buckets, and they opened up to visitors in 2011. Um, and the farm is actually located, located on a beautiful mountaintop at 4,000 feet in elevation. So they actually tend to tap lighter than most people in this area because of that elevation change. Um, and then for a fun fact, each year they cut 16 to 18 cords of firewood for the maple season. And I have to say, when they say they opened for visitors in 2011, they mean it. They now hold some great educational events. They have a really nice event space on the property, and it's well worth a visit if you're out near Highland. To look up more information about them, you can visit laurelforksapsuckers.com, and they have a really beautiful website. And last but definitely not least is Family Roots Farm and Brittany Hervey. They're actually our most Northern producer, possibly in the state. I don't know, Brittany, are you? The, uh, yeah, they're way up in our Northern panhandle of West Virginia. Um, and their story is pretty great. They actually began as a father-daughter project um, for school, I think, in 2000 with 20 taps. And then in 2012, Family, Food, Family Roots Farm was formed. Um, they now have 800 taps, uh, including some new ones right on site. And for a fun fact, the farm property was tomahawked by Henry Hervey in 1775. 
and has been in the family ever since. And there's their website is Family Roots Farm, West Virginia, if anybody is looking for more information on them. I have to say also, they have a really great selection of value added products. There's some really interesting stuff out there made with maple syrup. So let's get a little bit into the science. Um, I know that was a bit of a rushed introduction, but you all will get to meet them here in a little bit. Um, but I get to bore you with some science first. So I have a little video here and I'll fast forward a little bit, but this is really what it's all about, um, is that drip right there. And it is a weird combination that causes that of evolutionary biology, chemistry, tree anatomy, tree physiology, physics, biology. It's really a multifaceted science, which is pretty cool. Um, I have 30 minutes to tell you all about it. So we're gonna sort of try to, um, summarize as much as I can because people have spent their entire career studying this. And if you're really interested, I highly suggest looking more into it. It's pretty amazing. So we'll start with a little bit of tree anatomy, right? So this is not a specific tree, but this is a little cross section under a microscope of a tree. And you can see we have a couple different pieces that become pretty important when it comes to sap flow. One of the most important, I would say, is probably the vessels. And they're actually what runs vertically up and down the tree. And they're responsible for carrying fluids, nutrients, sugars, anything that tree needs from the roots all the way to the tops of the branches and vice versa. Also, what wood is made up of is fibers. And this is what actually gives the wood strength. Fibers don't really conduct much liquid through the tree at all. Um, they're just there to make sure that that tree stays standing nice and tall. And then ray cells are live cells. Um, and so are, uh, but they work on transporting nutrients from the outside of the tree to the inside of the tree. So they're what it's actually pushing nutrients toward, or nutrients for storage towards the center of the tree and then bringing it back out to the active um, wood when it's time. So looking a little bit more on specific trees, we look at vessel distribution. So there's a couple different types of wood that we talk about. One of which is, I think y'all can see my mouse here, is ring porous. Um, and ring porous is like your oaks and a lot of other hardwoods, um, but their vessels are actually distributed in rings around the tree. So they're, they're often quite large um, and they're, they basically, at the start of each growing season, ring porous trees grow an entirely new set of vessels. Then there's this weird combo, which is semi-ring porous. So it means it does have some of these larger vessels that they grow new each year, but also some smaller vessels, much like this diffuse porous all the way on your right. So the diffuse porous has very small vessels evenly distributed throughout the wood. That means that they don't all grow at the same time. And that's what we're dealing with in maples. Maples are a diffuse porous hardwood. So keep that in mind. So now trees are kind of in a fix. We know that live cells freeze and burst, right? We've seen pictures of frostbite. That's basically what's happening is ice crystals are forming in cells and breaking the cells apart. And that happens in plants. It's why if anybody, myself included, left a house plant outside for the first freeze, it doesn't do super well, right? because those cells are bursting. Um, similarly, if you ever put lettuce in the freezer, it doesn't come out all that well. Um, and then another issue they run into is their dead cells, as in the vessels, are filled with bubbles. So those vessels, those hollow cells, are actually hollow old cells that are now dead, but they get filled with these gas bubbles. Now, why is that a problem, right? It doesn't sound like a problem, but it is because what allows water to move from the roots of the tree all the way to the tips of the tree is um, the capillary effect in those small tubes. So if there's a bubble of gas, those water molecules can't actually travel up the um, vessel itself. 
So we're going to backtrack a little bit here and talk about what can a tree do to sort of fix some of these things, right? And we're gonna start by talking about some of the natural processes of the tree. First of which is photosynthesis. I think a lot of folks in the crowd are plant people and kind of know what photosynthesis is, but it is when chlorophyll and the leaves of plants take solar energy, carbon dioxide and water and transform it into glucose and oxygen. So this is a process that happens in all plants and specifically in trees in deciduous trees, which maples are, this happens during their growing season in preparation for the fact that they are gonna have to store some of these sugars to get through winter and bud out again in spring. So trees are then taking this glucose, right? This is what is made in, um, by the trees through photosynthesis and they're turning it into sucrose, which is a more complex molecule, and then even into starch. So that starch is basically long chains of sugars bonded together. And the reason trees turn this into starch is it's a much more stable molecule. And so those starches get transferred by the rays into the center of the tree for storage over the course of the winter. So that's what the trees are doing with their excess sugars, right? So during the growing season, they're producing sugars both so they can grow right then and there, but also so that they can store it away in preparation of having to winter over and bud out next spring. So why is this helpful for us when we're worried about cells freezing and bursting or worried about gas molecules, right? And honestly, it's because it's acting as antifreeze in a way. So cells are taking in these starch molecules and these sugar molecules. And if you've ever tried to freeze fruit juice, right? Sometimes it turns into a slush if your freezer isn't cool enough or cold enough. And that's because that sugar is actually dropping the freezing point of the liquid itself. And so that sugary antifreeze is kind of helping us with the fact that our cells are freezing and bursting, right? So trees have sort of solved that problem, right? If they put enough starch away over the, over the growing season into their cells, they're saving their cells from bursting, which is good, right? Because if all the, all the live cells in a tree burst by next spring, they would be dead, unfortunately. So that's one problem solved. There you go. Yeah, minimize that. So we're starting to talk about the fix to the fix, right? So we're talking about live cells freezing and bursting. That's solved by sugar as antifreeze. Now we're going to get into a slightly harder problem, right? And dead cells and vessels are filled with air gas bubbles. Now, if we think back to that first diagram of ring porous trees versus um, diffuse porous trees, right? The ring porous trees solve this problem by just growing new vessels. It doesn't matter if there's bubbles and weird things happening in their old vessels, they're not going to use them. They just grow new ones, right? Now, diffuse porous hardwoods need to somehow fix the fact that they have gas bubbles in their vessels from wintering over, right? Um, so that they can use those to then get ready to grow more throughout the growing season. And that's where maples are standing. They have this problem. Right, because then there is spring, right? We, the reason it is a problem is they're trying to get ready to grow. And now we have to solve that problem. And so the, just to sort of backtrack a little bit, um, this is kind of exemplifying why it's a problem. Those gas bubbles would get in the way of the process of transpiration where water is being pulled from the roots up the stem and being um, evaporated out of the leaves. But if there were a gas bubble in the stem, um, we would not be experiencing um, full water transport up the stem. and. 
here's sort of a different picture of it. If you're having a hard time understanding why, right? So water molecules are pretty cool. Um, they have poles. They actually are a polar molecule, meaning that the oxygen molecule, the big O circle here, is actually slightly negatively charged and the hydrogens are slightly positively charged. So water molecules like to actually bond to each other slightly um, because of those slightly positive, slightly negative charges, they are attracted to each other. That's why it, you can drop a drop of water onto your desk and it's still going to have a little bit of a rounded top to it, right? It's not immediately going to run apart from each other. It likes to sort of hold together. Um, but the reason this also is important is because this is what's helping create that capillary action because as this top water molecule is pulled up, it is going to help pull the next one with it, right? Now, if you throw a gas bubble in the mix, those bonds can't happen. And this water molecule is not going to pull the water molecule under the gas bubble. So this is sort of what we're looking at in the trees. Right, and another sort of visualization for it is for you all is if you are dealing with frozen trees with a bit of water in it, right? You have these trapped bubbles, much like why ice is always a little cloudy is you have a lot of trapped micro bubbles. And so what we're trying to do is get from this situation to a situation where all the vessels are full of just pure water or not pure water, but liquid and there's no gas bubbles. Now, this is where a little bit of physics comes in. If you think back to Henry's gas law, it states that gases under pressure dissolve in a liquid. Um, and if you want the actual law, it's there. It's P equals KC, where P is pressure of a gas, K is Henry's law constant, and C is concentration of the gas. And a great example of Henry's gas law is actually sodas, right? So in a soda factory, the way they get carbonation into their soda is they inject carbon dioxide into the soda and then bottle it under pressure, right? That's why when you open a bottle of soda, especially if you've shaken it, it gases off. It's as soon as you're releasing that pressure, the gas is coming out of solution. And that's where we get the bubbles, but that's also why, um, if you leave a soda open, all that gas will eventually escape and you'll have flat soda. So keep that in mind. Maples are basically doing that. They're trying to dissolve the gas bubbles into their sap by creating positive pressure. Isn't that wild? This is not an edited picture. You can actually see the positive pressure in a maple tree by just screwing a pressure gauge into the side of the tree. I think, I, I don't know about y'all, but that always blows my mind. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, and the cool thing too is, is you can actually like physically see it, which is um, also mind blowing. If you take the, the DBH um, or the circumference of the tree at night and then during the peak of the day, on a warm day in early spring, um, it is actually slightly bigger because that positive pressure is pushing out on the tree. I think it's wild. Uh, if, if other plant nerds are out there, it's crazy. So how, how is it creating this pressure, right? It, it doesn't make sense. You can't blow a tree up like a tire, right? And so this is my little diagram. Um, it's I like it. I think it works. Um, so at night on these cold nights of early spring, right, we're getting below freezing. So wa uh, the water and sap that is in the tree is actually getting pulled up and starting to freeze in these tiny, tiny branches out near the end. And when that water actually freezes, it pushes its way out of the vessels and into the tissue around the vessel. So you're actually getting sort of this, um, pull effect, which is pulling more water in for, through the roots. So if we're not tapping, we're not thinking about it in terms of sap production, we're thinking about it in terms of tree health. It's how the tree is pulling more water into itself to create more sap for itself. Um, and so it's actually creating a negative pressure at night while this is happening. As those 
water molecules are freezing and escaping into the little tissue around those um, branches, it is creating a bit of a vacuum in the tree, which is pulling more water into it. But then in early spring, right, we're getting those nights where it's like, wow, it's still cold. It's still below freezing. But then during the day, we're getting up to those balmy 40, 50 degree days, right? So the sun comes out and those ice crystals in those little um, branches actually start to melt. And those, that head pressure, basically, the fact that there's a lot of water up in the top of the tree creates an internal positive pressure, right? Because it's flushing more water into those vessels. Um, so that's why we're seeing that positive pressure, which is pretty cool. And it is liquid, so it wants to travel sort of down the tree a bit. So now if you think of it in terms of sap production, we have a tree under pressure, under positive pressure, and you put a hole in it, right? Whatever's in that tree is going to want to come out because the pressure outside that hole, the atmospheric pressure, is less than the pressure in the tree. It's kind of like if you were to put a hole in a tire, a little less uh, immediately like, but same idea. So here's kind of an interesting experiment and you can actually see it at work here. So what you're looking at here is a video from Cornell. So we have the time of day, the temperature, Right now it's saying 43, 44, and this is a pressure gauge. If you notice that pressure gauge is actually pointing positive. And if you watch the bucket, you can see the bucket fill up. Now sap's not blue, it's clear, but they dropped some um, coloring in it to make it easier. Now watch that needle dip, right? It now just dipped to negative and we're down at 25 degrees. And this is, this is actually what's happening in the tree. You can do this with a maple tree in your yard and see pretty similar results because this is just evolutionary. What evolutionarily, what these trees have developed to conquer those two major issues with winter, right? A lot of plants initially originated near the equator where it's warm, right? And as they traveled north, they had to evolve to adapt to the climate. And so this is how maple trees have evolved to deal with winter itself, which is pretty cool. So now we've kind of talked about why sap flows in spring, right? We are getting a lot of sugar in the sap from photosynthesis and the trees are storing sugar both as an energy store, but also as a natural antifreeze. And so that's sort of why we get sweet sap and maples. Now, we've also talked about why sap flows, right? We're getting this negative pressure at night, which helps recharge the sap supply from the ground, and then positive pressure front during the day, which pushes sap out into our buckets, which is really nice. If anybody here is a sugar maker, maker and accidentally tapped an oak tree, you know that you're not gonna get much, right? <laughs> Oak trees don't run, unfortunately. Ooh, I didn't mean to restart that, but the video is really cool. You can find it on YouTube if anybody's looking. If you look up like Cornell pressure experiment, I think it pops up. Um, now let's talk about some species we use, right? There's the classic. This is a sugar maple leaf. Now, why do we use the sugar maple? We've talked about the processes in the tree that make it possible for us to make syrup from a sugar maple, right? And the reason it's called a sugar maple is because it is really classically used to make syrup and it is because it tends to naturally have a higher sugar content. For whatever reason, genetically sugar maples are predisposed to put more sugar into their sap during spring. Now, Interestingly enough, it's not quite proven yet, but it's sort of the theory out there is that those freeze thaw cycles that both let us have that negative pressure at night in the tree, positive pressure during the day in the tree, also probably trigger an enzyme that breaks down that starch back into sucrose and some other um, 
smaller sugar molecules, which is kind of why it's like re-entering this app stream. But that's not proven yet. We're working on it. Um, and by we, I mean the greater uh, maple community. Now, looking at other maple species, right? So maple syrup is actually made by anything in the Acer genus. So that's Norway maple, red maple, silver maple, sugar maple, maple, box elder, black maple. Um, people out west are looking at uh, big leaf maple. There's, uh, I think some folks looking at sawtooth maple. There's, I mean, there's a lot of people looking at all versions of the Acer genus and some folks over in Ohio at Ohio State are even looking at something they're calling the mystery maple because they're not quite sure of the genetic sequence of it yet, which is pretty cool. Um, and the reason any maple makes maple syrup, but we can't sell like walnut syrup as maple syrup is because the, um, I didn't get into this too much in the science just because we have a, we have a, a limited amount of time, but the flavor of maple syrup is determined by the, I always say this where I always say it like the duck, but it's the Maillard browning reactions um, that happen between the micronutrients, the sugars and the heat in your evaporating pan, which is like pretty freaking cool. And so the cool thing about that is there is no such thing as like fake maple syrup flavoring because it is such a like specifically created flavor. Um, so a lot of things that are maple flavored actually do have some maple syrup somewhere in them. It might be a very small amount, but it's very hard to like artificially create maple flavor, um, which is pretty cool. Now let's talk other species, right? So we have walnut, sycamore, birch, and beech. And the reason um, people tap these, a lot of it is like folk tradition. There's um, long histories of tapping walnut and birch and even some of sycamore. But another reason we know we can tap these is because walnut is a semi ring porous, which means it's partially diffuse. And so it's going to do something similar to what maples are doing. Sycamore is diffuse, birch is diffuse, beech is diffuse. So we all kind of know they're working under like similar properties. But interestingly enough, birch actually runs under root pressure. So instead of doing the, instead of following the freeze thaw, freeze thaw cycle, birch actually runs when the soil heats up and creates an, uh, an in, internal positive pressure through osmosis of taking in water from its roots, which is pretty cool. Sort of a side tangent. Um, each one of these syrup types is being studied in depth and it, well, on it, on the way to being studied in depth and it's, um, they're all very different. I could probably, if we wanted to talk about all of them, you guys would be here until tomorrow morning. But um, walnut, for just some quirks, walnut tends to not run as much as maple um, and has pectin in it, which is something different, but it's nice and nutty and a dark flavor. And there are people commercially making walnut syrup. Sycamore syrup um, tends to have sort of a butterscotchy flavor and uh, actually runs better under vacuum. So uh, in maple, people have started to use vacuum. If, um, if some of you out there are maple producers, you know about this. And that is because a lot of people say they suck the sap out of the tree. They're not actually sucking the sap out of the tree, but they're creating a bigger pressure differential between that internal positive pressure and the external atmospheric pressure, right? So if you put a vacuum to the tap hole, you're dropping the external atmospheric pressure. So there's a greater difference and therefore more sap will actually be pushed out, which is pretty cool. Um, birch is being commercially made and um, it can both be kind of like savory sweet. It's, it's a very different flavor from maple. And then beech is sort of in the infancy, infancy of being looked at. I know very little about it because it's really, just getting started. Um, but what I've heard is it also runs better under vacuum. Now let's talk some other products. Um, it's, there's a lot out there, right? We've all seen maple flavored, maple this, maple that, syrup this, syrup that. 
Um, so we can start on the left here. There's such thing as sparkle syrup, and it's actually by a real maple syrup company called Runamuck up in uh, Vermont. But you know, like any business, you need to set yourself apart somehow. And so they decided to put edible glitter in their syrup. And so they have sparkle syrup, which uh, I know a couple little girls that would be a big hit with. Then there's shag bark, sip, sip, blah, 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 shag bark hickory syrup. Um, and this is often confusing to people. So the reason I didn't mention hickory back on this side, slide with the other species is because it is not a tree syrup in the sense that these all are, right? Maple syrup, walnut syrup, sycamore syrup, birch syrup, beech syrup are all made by boiling down pure sap. There's no other ingredients in pure tree or maple syrup than maple sap. That's it. Hickory syrup um, is actually made by toasting the bark of the hickory tree and then steeping it in a cane sugar syrup. So it still tastes really good, but it's just I kind of put it in a different category of product in my mind. It's just not the same um, realm, I would say, as pure maple syrup. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad and a lot of producers make it and I think it tastes pretty good, but it, I mean, it's good to know what you're buying, you know, and how it's made, um, which is why I bring it up. And then there's, this was one that uh, was interesting that I found when I was looking at other products on the market. There's keto maple syrup. Um, and you can't really tell in the picture I used, but in very tiny font between the word maple and syrup is flavored. And that is because it is not actually made out of maple syrup. It's made out of other products and then flavored like maple. Now this is actually maple syrup and you'll see a lot of this. And this is bourbon barrel aged maple syrup and a lot of people in the maple world, um, including some folks on this call uh, and our panelists who I'm sure will be happy to tell you about their infused syrups have sort of gotten into this infused syrup realm. So there's coffee, there's cinnamon, there's blueberry, there's um, chili pepper, ginger, all kinds of flavored maple syrup out there. And the cool thing about maple syrup is it's actually really good at picking up other flavors. So uh, for example, bourbon barrel aged maple syrup is pure maple syrup that people have just put in a bourbon barrel and let sit for a while. Um, cinnamon maple syrup is people stick a cinnamon stick in their maple syrup, or actually quite a few cinnamon sticks, and let it sit for a while. And the syrup kind of picks up that cinnamon flavor. So it's still pure maple syrup, just with a little bit of extra in it. Um, and then the cool thing too is now people are starting to package their maple syrup in different ways, right? So we're all pretty used to this classic flask bottle, but um, a company out of Vermont is making little to-go squeeze packets for maple syrup on the go and actually marketing it as a like alternative to the sports goos that are now on the market for marathoners and athletes um, as a like quick shot of energy, which is pretty cool. And then this bottom row is what a lot of people grew up on, right? The Hungry Jack, the Miss Buttersworth, the Log Cabin. Um, and these are all, often they're not even uh, maple flavored, they're often butter flavored, but they're all corn syrup based. So there, there's really no tree sap in those, even though people often refer to them as syrup or um, maple syrup often. So that is sort of the end of my 201. I'm gonna go ahead, wait, let me just make sure. Yeah, we're gonna move on to some questions here with our panelists and then I think that's right, Katie. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> there was one question real quick. There, yeah. there are questions in the chat and we'll or in the QA feature and we'll get to those um, at some point. But I was just maybe gonna ask you a couple real quick ones that are yeah. pretty fast. Um, do you know if you can tap sassafras trees for syrup? Good question. I'm not sure. I would have to do a little bit of research. Um I know like sassafras is often made from, I think it's the root tips of um, the tree, like mm -hmm. sassafras flavoring. 
Um, I'm not as familiar with it, but there's going to be an email address at the end here that if, if you have specific questions of things you would like to know more about, I'm always happy to do a little digging for folks. I love learning about trees and cool products. So um, yeah, feel free to leave, re reach out. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And also one other quick one from your mm -hmm. talk and then we'll um, open it up to the, to the farmer panelists. Um, does the pressure uh, phenomenon you were mentioning happen in all trees in the spring? So no, like oak trees don't develop that internal pressure and that's why you can't actually get any sap out of them. It doesn't mean that oak trees don't have sap, but their evolutionary mechanism is to grow new vessels rather than repair the ones they have. And so um, they, they, they don't, uh, wow, they don't develop that positive pressure, which means if you tap an oak tree, there's sap in there, but it's not going to run out into your bucket. Okay, great. Um, well, do you feel like bringing on the panelists and- Yeah, one second. One thing some... popped up in the chat and it said, what about pines? Um, the thing about pines is because they're an evergreen, they don't actually um, have to deal with the whole like go into dormancy. Um, they've developed evolutionary tactics to just live through the winter um, or like not go dormant through the winter, if that makes sense. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, panelist questions. Um, sorry, let me just change my screen around a little bit. Awesome. So for folks in the audience, these three people, uh, these three lovely women on this call for um, our panelists are all really excellent sugar makers. Um, and I told you guys a lot about what can influence your, or like what is driving the actual sap flow, right? And so I think it, it's interesting from the more practical side of it to kind of talk about what does that mean to a producer, right? What does all this science actually mean for you on the ground? So I have a couple questions for you all if you guys are ready. So I was kind of wondering if you guys could talk about what have you done on your farms to sort of help improve your sap output? And we can start with whoever would like to hop in there. Um, I'll, I'll share um, with what we've been working on to improve our, our SAP output. Well, first it kind of goes back to, we weren't the best at record keeping. And um, in order for us to improve, we had to start keeping better records. Um, and when we started doing that, we found a lot of things that we should be making a lot more sap. So um, we reached out to future generations and, um, and had gone over some of our practices to, to, better, to better our operation. So with us, um, we use a sap cooler rather than a traditional vacuum system. And there's a little bit things you should be doing differently. And we were following practices for a traditional vacuum. Um, so we are just tweaking things a little bit um, to see if we can improve that sap yield. The other thing, um, as far as comparing the 3 16th lines to the 5 16th, uh, and focusing on the sanitation to see if that's why our yields are a little bit lower. But I, I feel to, to improve your operation and your efficiency is to have those records to see where you need to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Missy or Rachel, do you guys wanna hop in? Sure, I'll um, say that when we decided to take the jump from being a hobby producer to a commercial producer, we decided that we wanted to learn as much as we could before we invested in, in these technologies. So we went to um, a specific maple like educational training facility and, and learned all about the different economics of things and like the different types of equipment. So like what types of reverse osmosis are there? What types of tubing systems are there in, in that? So we based our decisions first on 
on that and was able to get feedback directly from industry experts. And then um, probably our second biggest thing that we do to ensure good yields is we're in the woods all the time. Um, one of the industry experts said that you make your money in the woods, not in the sugar house. Um, because if you don't have sap coming in, then there's not any syrup to be made. So we just try to run what we call a really tight system. So every day, you know, we're out there checking, checking our tubing system, checking lines, checking for leaks, and then just um, keeping every leaks at a minimum. So those are probably the biggest things that we do. Mm -hmm. And Missy, I know you all do a lot of similar things, but you also take a little bit more of a woods management approach as well. Most certainly, Kate. Um, for us, it kind of started in the woods to begin with. Um, my dad, we're very um, forestry heavy family. Um, everyone's been in the logging business. Um, I have a degree in forestry, so we focus on the trees um, foremost. But I think like 21 years ago now, we thinned out an area for a sugar bush. Um, we also have one that we then six years ago, and then the most recent was three years. And we're kind of keeping records of those as far as are we increasing our sap yield and um, are we increasing the sugar content on those? Um, and we've been kind of measuring that for the last three years. And just like Kate alluded earlier with photosynthesis, um, the trees use that to make that sugar by opening up the canopy space by taking out some of those um, oak and hickory and even sometimes maple trees to open up the canopy for the larger, more desirable maples to grow. Uh, we have increased our sugar content. Um, now granted we're at 4,000 feet and we have a um, 600 acre farm that is all timber. So we're not gonna get those two and a half percent sugar contents. But for us, if we can get you know, 1.8, 1.9, we are super happy at the end of the day. And that is kind of what we've found. Um, but, you know, making that commitment before you put the tubing out to check, to look at the woods and set those up properly um, has really been helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, so folks are aware, often we say sugar maple sap runs around like two to 3%, red maple sap runs around like one-ish, um, one to 1.5, um, yeah. It's it it can vary, but um, just to sort of illustrate that point, somebody uh, I helped tap the other day is running at two point seven five percent sugar on field edge trees, which is pretty impressive if you can tell by the faces of the three producers here. Um, Brittany, you were talking about keeping data. What sap flow and yield data do you actually track? So um, we currently. Um have two different woodlots that we tap. So we separate our records that way. Um, and we first note the date we tapped. And then as the sap water, so we're on top of a, a hill as well. So we have to transport our sap water back to us. And um, so we, we keep that separate as far as how many gallons we got at each sugar bush. Um, and then we all, we do take a percentage of, um, to see what our sugar content is, and we and we document that. Uh, we have a general notes area where we try to note the weather to see if we can, you know, figure out any patterns. Um, but that is an area that we just can't get it all to sync together. Um, you know, maple production is really weather dependent, and it's kind of what Mother Nature gives you for a season. Um, so. So we all we do like to try to keep track of that to see and predict how long our our season's going going to last. Um, but kind of what Missy had said about that sugar content, and it's so interesting to what Kate shared with us is the science behind maple, is you know why thinning trees out are are so important is those big crowns, and understanding the science behind it helps us producers um, better our operation. So the way that I like to think about it, you know, the bigger the crown, you know, that trees stored more energy through photosynthesis. Um, so it's most likely gonna have a higher sugar content and you most likely are gonna get a lot more sap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rachel, do you guys track anything different that you might suggest? 
um, when the atom tracks the amount of sap that comes in, he put, has a flow meter and then the places that we go and collect, you know, we'll collect the amount of sap coming in, but then we track um, the sap sugar content also. And then when we bottle our syrup up, we'll keep track of the date that we do it, how much we'd make in that batch. And then we try to make um, at the end of bottling each time we make comments like about what we thought the maple syrup tasted like. Like our first batch that we made a couple days ago, we thought it had a buttery flavor to it. Um, and so we'll make those comments. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And it's cool if you visit their sugar shot, they actually have all the records of the flavor profiles, which is pretty cool. Missy, do you tra guys track anything different? Um, those things for sure, but as Brittany was saying or alluding to is weather. Um, I, I really love the weather. So we have a weather station um, at the 4,000 foot, the highest tap tree. And then we have two sensors, two probes that we put out um, mid slope and then lower elevation. And the really cool thing with that is that we have um, a lot of evenings we'll empty the tanks and think that you know we're good to go and then come back the next morning and they're like three quarters full. So we get a lot of inversions on the mountain. So that's pretty awesome to kind of be able to keep um, keep records of that. But um, back to the trees, um, we've been uh, focusing on keeping records of like this one, it's like a 10 acre area that we harvested and we've been measuring those tree diameters and heights um, for the last five years and um, just we've picked up <laughs> um, over an inch diameter in those in those trees in the last five years and now about 40 percent of those it's somewhere between 230 to 250 trees in that stand um, we've been doing a lot of work in there we just added another 20 taps to that of trees that we were able to tap but of those 40 percent of those could handle two taps if we wanted to put those two taps on there so they're that 18 to 24 inch diameter of trees so um, that's pretty interesting to see how quickly those trees responded, put on that growth and how quickly you can add that second tap to them. Yeah, that is really interesting. I think that's the first time I've heard those numbers and that's, well, yeah, yeah that's pretty incredible. <laughs> now, this is all great, right? If you understand the tree science, but um, part of being a sugar maker is also talking to people outside the sugaring industry. So how does, do you present the science or like the processes of what you do to your visit visitors at your sugar shacks. And do you guys think it has an impact on their experience and even their buying habits? Would uh, you like to start, Missy? Yeah, I'm just, I think that, um just like this evening with all the participants here, um, power, like knowledge is power, like empowering people when they come to your farm to know how a product is made, um, for them to be excited about that, take that product back and then share with their friends and family. Though you're, you're not only are you teaching someone, but you're also um, increasing your customer base by doing that. You're, you're letting, you're teaching that one person and then they're teaching other, and then they're gonna continue to come back to you. Um, and then, you know, um, most people are completely unaware of, like, I know that you just went into a lot of science and all that, you know, and we understand that, but like, literally you tap a tree, you boil it down and you have maple syrup and, and people are kind of um, confused by like that, by that. They want to know um, where you add the sugar, where do you add the maple flavoring? You know, if they, they really are amazed at the process. Um, so I think that everyone that we can educate becomes a fan of and therefore a consumer, which helps all of us um, in the industry, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Brittany and Rachel, you, well, actually, and Missy, all of you work with uh, school children as well. So if you wanna talk anything about your experience working with kids too, feel free to. Mm -hmm. we, um, we really enjoy working with our Pocahontas County High School Forestry class. They have a pretty neat program where, um, it turns out actually a lot of, you know, pretty experienced um, kids who then go on to forestry in college and, and things like that. So it's just really interesting showing those kids who know something already about basic forestry about these non-timber forest products, because 
um, Mr. Garber, that's the high school teacher, does a great job teaching them, you know, about, you know, the value of timber and forest management and stuff like that, but they don't delve much into the other areas. So it's really neat to, and every year, one of our favorite activities is saying, okay, how much is um, hard maple going for per thousand? And so then we come up with the number, like what the current market is. And we give them like an example, like we have five acres of trees and how much would you get if you cut this five acres? And, you know, so there's your money for the next 50 to 70 years. And then we, you know, tell them, okay, you have this five acres and there's this many taps and you're going to sell it bulk versus sell it retail versus turn it into value added products. So then we can show them, you know, the income that is potentially made off of, you know, having it be non on timber. So that's one of our favorite things to do with the kids. Absolutely. That's a great activity. You're with a slightly different age group, Brittany, I think. Yeah, so well, I c cover a wide variety of age groups, but um, I've had the opportunity to, to become a, a teacher at Wheeling Country Day School. So I have the sixth grade students there and um, it's been really fun to dive deeper into the science behind Maple um, with them and connect things like Kate said, there's so many options you can go. Um, so we recently did the Sugar on Snow um, experiment as part of class where they got to make, you know, their maple um, suckers is what they, how they refer to it. So they are hands-on learning, um, whether you come to our farm or any, um, for us, that's a passion of ours is to learn by doing. So we host a lot of events on our farm. I take a lot to the schools um, so that when you have that hands-on experience, you have that connection, you know, the next time you go to get or purchase maple syrup, you're going to think of that story behind there. Um, and I feel like that's how we kind of created like a brand loyalty or like a following is through education. Um, but I think I could tie everything back to education. And that is just something that I just absolutely love um, is connecting folks of all ages um, with maple syrup. And I'm with you, Kate. I wanna turn everyone around me that loves maple syrup as much as I do and the process on how to make it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm, I'm known for just trying to get everybody to put a tap in a tree somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just to I... note, my students gathered their, or collected their first sap today. Um, so we got to test the sugar content and we had done a lot of measuring trees um, last week. So they had to figure out why the difference of sugar content and they really enjoyed that. Um, so, you know, that connection is something I feel that will stick with you more than, you know, reading something out of a textbook. Um, but the other cool thing that we're doing is uh, branching into that value added. So obviously the class is not gonna make enough syrup to sell. So the class project is making maple cotton candy. So we're taking, we're going to turn their, their syrup into maple sugar and then they're marketing their maple cotton candy. So that way they come full circle. That's awesome. Um, man, that's so cool. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, is there anything, I guess this is a good wrap up question. Is there anything that you are looking to do differently or new in the future? Like where do you guys see yourselves heading in the next year or two production wise? Um, well, we're obviously building a website. So um, most of our sales had been through direct to consumer at fairs and festivals. And for the past two years, that hasn't been the case. So um, we focused more on on-farm sales, so trying to get people to come to us. And we have a road stand that's on the honor system that sells a lot of syrup for us, which is great. But we um, realized that we're missing out on, you know, a lot of online sales because right now we just have a Facebook page. So we're going to develop a website and delve into, into that area. Nice. Do you know what the URL is going to be yet? Rossmorefarm.com. I secured that, so... 
Awesome. So in, in a couple months, everybody should look up frostmorefarms.com. Mm -hmm. Missy, you guys have anything? Um, well, we're trying out the new Zapback spouts, um, antimicrobial spouts this year to see how that's going to affect our sap flow. Um, trying out a few new sanitation practices. Um, we've kind of gone through and taken a lot of those second taps out of, the, out of the trees. Just, I don't think that that's quite worth it as far as um, long-term goals. Uh, I have a 13 year old and a 11 year old. I want them to uh, tap those trees as well. Um, but the biggest thing for us is um, our event space. Um, we're gonna start really um, promoting that as a wedding space. So anybody who wants to get married in the uh, sugar bush or an actively working sugar camp during maple season, um, it would be available for you. So that's kind of where we're moving um, with, the, with the event space. So that's good. Nice. And Brittany. So for us, um, it kind of goes back to what Rachel had said about it starts in the, the sugar bush and just getting everything as like tightened up and the production at its most. So we're kind of taking a step back. Um, we are dropping one of our woodlots this year. We're not tapping. So we're going to be down this number of taps. But we're hoping to make actually more syrup than we did last year on less tap. So um, it's a little bit different strategy, uh, but we need to get our, our production um, mastered before we add any, add any, add any more. Nice. That sounds awesome. Um, Katie, if it's all right with you, we've got a lot of questions from folks in the audience. So I was thinking about moving on to audience Q&A a little early if you're all right with that. Yeah, that's a great idea, Kate. If Are you in the Q&A feature? Are you able to see the yeah. question there? Yeah, yeah. let's take point. Um, let me know if you need anything and then you can, um, there are some specific questions addressed to the panelists. If anybody has any additional questions to add, if you have a specific person you'd like to address them to, just make sure to note that. But otherwise, Kate, if you just want to move through the list and also open it up to the panel when it's appropriate as well. Feel free to. Absolutely. No problem. Uh, this is actually probably a good one. I think all of you know the answer to this. Uh, what diameter do you need to tap? Yeah, eight to 10 inches is often uh, what we say minimum for tapping size. And if for those of you out there who need sort of a better picture of that, it's about a dinner plate. Um, so that's one tap. And then as Missy was mentioning earlier, 18 to 24 inches is two taps. And often for most full grown adults, that's about a bear hug. Um, so if you barely can touch your fingers on the far side of the tree, it's a two tap tree is sort of a general rule of thumb. Uh, do, are there any long-term impacts for removing a tree's sugar and starch storage over multiple seasons, or is it their management practice that allows this for sustainable production. So there's actually been a lot of studying of this. Um, and again, if, if you are really interested in the science, a great place to start is mapleresearch.org. Um, Katie, if you could just throw that in the chat. It's, it has a lot of people in the maple industry have been working really hard to sort of centralize all of maple research onto that website and it's open access, it's free, it's great if you're really into it go there, explore. It's pretty awesome. Um, but no, there's actually really no long-term um, side effects to it. I, the way I put it to people a lot of the time is it's like a blood donation. You can give a pint of blood and be fine. Um, and when you tap a tree, you're really only taking about, I think it's, they calculated out, but it's about like 12 to 20% of the sap out of the tree. Um, you're leaving a lot for the tree itself. And, uh, they have not found any statistical, ooh, did they? I don't think so. I don't think they've found any statistical differences yet in the growth rates of a tap tree and an untapped tree. So you're really not harming your trees. Um, when we talk about tapping size, that's actually part of the sustainable practice. And that is because um, every time you tap, you make a small column of deadwood. But if you tap in the right size zones, basically by the time you tap around the tree and come back around to where you tap the first time, that tree's had enough time to put on about two more inches of sapwood. 
um, which means that you're now tapping into clean, unharmed wood. So that's, um, it's a really sustainable production model. Um, there's like trees across the country that have been tapped for hundred plus years and are still being tapped today. Uh, for those who have tapped walnut, birch and beech, what is the timing season difference between them and maple? Um, walnut tends to be pretty in line with maple. I sometimes tap them like a week after I would tap maples, but not by much. Birch, um, old like rule of thumb, I tap my birches uh, with the few times I've tapped birches right after the maple season ends. It's sort of right at the start of like true warm spring. Um, and then beach, I'm not sure. I've never tapped them. There's very little research out there yet, um, but there are some folks starting to play around with it. Um, again, walnuts tapped later, maybe by a little bit, not by a ton um, as far as what we know right now. Oh, here's a good one for our panelists. Could you explain the different grades of maple syrup? I've seen grade A and B, and I'm not sure what that means. They all taste good. Any of you guys want to tackle that one? Um, so a couple of years back, they had changed the international grading standard and it just has confused consumers. I don't know if any other of you have feel that too. So now everything is considered grade A and it is based on the flavor and the color. And what can control that is a couple of different things. So early in the season, you're most likely going to make a light syrup. And as the season progresses, you're going to end up more with a darker syrup. And one of the things that's found is comes down to, you know, sanitation. Um, there's nothing bad with darker syrup, but, you know, the faster you boil um, and the, and the, I want to say the cleaner, the more sanitized, like if you rinse your tanks out throughout the season and that sort of sort of thing, you're going to make a lighter syrup. Mm -hmm. Would any of you like to add anything, Rachel or Missy? I think it also has to do a little bit with the amount of sugar content that you're starting with as well. Like um, we've never been able to make golden, like the lightest syrup, even in the beginning of the seasons. And um, we're pretty clean people, like pretty, pretty uh, OCD about being clean and sanitizing things and washing things. And so we were wondering, you know, why aren't we making golden syrup? And I think it's partly because we have a high percentage of red maples that we tap. And then, um, you know, because we were processing it quickly, it wasn't getting warmed up, things like that, that other people, you know, were, were making golden syrup. But then later in the season, when it's warmer, there's just a lot more naturally occurring yeast and bacteria too that eat on that sugar. And then you have to boil it longer. So I think the caramelization makes it, makes it darker to add to what Brittany said. Absolutely. Missy, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, for us, we've never been able to make like the strong flavored maple syrup until last year. And it was because of that ridiculously short season. And I think it is those sugars and um, um, caramelizing that longer. But the other thing is like, when you're looking at this new grading system, think of it as kind of like a roast on coffee. That's kind of the way I compare it is like, do you like a lighter roast or a darker roast? Do you like, you know, um, light syrup versus dark syrup? It's lighter syrup. You want that to stand alone by itself. Definitely great for pancakes. Darker syrup, you can start mixing that in with other foods um, and that flavor will still, still, still shine through. So I kind of tell people how to cook with it a little bit and what they can expect the flavor to be like, and then they have to discern from themselves because each one of us, I can guarantee you like a different grade of syrup for sure. So, mm -hmm. And if you're like me, you just have a shelf in your fridge that is all syrups for different uses. <laughs> but uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, the old grading system, grade A was that light, like golden or amber syrup and grade B was dark or very dark syrup. Um, they changed it because it made it seem like grade B was worse. It's not worse, just a different flavor palette. Um, I would, I would suggest everybody try them all and figure out what you like best. So, hey, Tina, uh, uh, all three of us on this call know Tita Barton from the association, but, um, or all four of us, what about the work Proctor did with tapping saplings? I was watching a video about that recently, and they claimed that the sap was coming 
came up from below. So for those of you who are not familiar, Proctor Maple Research, or Proctor is part of UVM and it's one of the leading maple research centers in the world. Um, and they were doing this work where they were tapping saplings and I mean like sapling, sapling, small, small trees by actually cutting the top off and putting like a suction cup over the end. Uh, kind of wild, but <laughs> they're sort of playing around with this on this idea that like, well, if you can do this, then you could plant a maple farm, which is kind of cool. Um, and what we found with this is actually, uh, so maple trees are doing this like top down pressure, um, which we're calling like head pressure, right? But we're all, uh, they also sort of are, they're doing the same thing as I was saying with the bir birch of a little bit of that osmotic root pressure. So part of what is helping suck water in from the, those roots is both the negative pressure the tree creates and then the osmotic, um, well, the process of osmosis. Um, I didn't get into it too much because it, it my, my talk was getting very long, um, but osmosis rate right, is the uh, passing of water molecules through a semipermeable membrane um, to correct a concentration gradient. So the sugars are actually helping with this too. Those sugars on the inside of the tree are creating a higher concentration of other things in the water than there is in the soil, helping suck water into the tree itself through those root fibers. Um, so there is water coming up from the bottom as well. Um, it's, it's, for the sake of simplifying, I didn't talk about it as much because it's less of a factor in maple than it is in trees like a birch, um, but it is happening and that's why that sapling tapping worked. Um, they're still working on like if it's sustainable, if it's worth the cost, how to do it on a large scale, all those kind of questions, but um, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of really cool maple research going on out there. Another cool one, just for those uh, tree nerds out there, Cornell is breeding genetically higher sugar content trees. And so they have some trees up there that they tap that naturally have 10% sugar, which is wild. <laughs> but they've just basically been like selectively breeding trees. Go figure. <laughs> Sweet. So does taking the sap for syrup hurt the tree or more to the point, are we taking something that hinders their highest survival next spring? And again, this is kind of, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We're not um, sort of like a blood donation, right? You'll survive, you'll produce more blood. Trees will produce more sap, they'll survive. Um, okay, is there timing on the other species, i.e. walnut, sycamore, the same freezing nights and above freezing days? For the most part, yes. The one exception to that that I know of, again, I don't know that much about beech, but is the birch. Um, and that is because it is working on root pressure pretty much only, and therefore it happens when the soil and the ground starts to thaw out. Ooh, is there a map for when to tap trees in different geographical areas? That would be really cool if there was. Um, Unfortunately, it's so dependent on local weather. And as Missy uh, was talking about inversions on her mountain, local weather can have such small um, like micro events that it's very hard to sort of generalize. Um, I mean, I, thinking about it, I could probably put together a map of like generally of like, producers in this area tend to tap like early January. But then again, every producer sort of has a different strategy of when to tap too. So um, like, I, I guess a good example is you, Missy, you guys tap probably close to a week later than a lot of the producers around you. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, most certainly. We're at least seven to 10 days behind um, most of the producers. And then of course we're making syrup a week and a half after they've completely finished. Mm -hmm. And just like Rachel said, they've already made their first batch of syrup this year. And um, we're just now starting to tap trees today. So, and mm -hmm. we live what, as the crow flies, just kind of like top of the mountain, the bottom of the mountain away from each other, Rachel. So <laughs> yeah, pretty close. And there's still that big of a difference. So. If Missy shot a firework off, we'd probably see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, 
Brittany, you're not that high in elevation, but you guys are more in line with Missy just because you are further north in the state, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it is kind of hard to guess. Um, you know, typically we don't tap till more towards the end of February, um, but this year, I mean, we started tapping Monday, like Monday, um, so we're anticipating our first run over the weekend. Um, but that's always the million dollar question when to tap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, my best piece of advice is find a good local weather source and track it closely. Um, whether that's putting in your own weather station like Missy did, or just finding one that is normally pretty accurate to where you live. And just a, a quick note, just remember you're looking for that free, the freeze thaw cycle. So you're looking for those warm sunny days and those cold freezing nights. That's what's gonna get the sap flowing. Mm -hmm. I have one thing to add about the tapping time. We've never really fretted about tapping too early as long as it's cold, um, just because if it's cold, the bacteria isn't gonna grow. So a lot of the times we'll look at that extended weather forecast and maybe try to tap a little bit early knowing that if we can get out there and get that done, then we'll catch some of the first runs and be done with that. Um, but we're also on high vacuum, um, which helps keep your bacteria down as compared to if you're a bucket or a bag, you know, like that type of producer. But we don't usually fret about tapping too early where we're at. Yeah. Um, for reference for folks, there are producers up in the Northeast and the Northeast obviously taps in Canada taps like their runs happen later than they do down here in sort of the Southern reaches of the maple industry. Um, but they start tapping around Thanksgiving because they have to put 500,000 taps in trees. So they just have to do it for the sake of the amount of work it is. Um, it's all, it's all at, it, it's such a huge part of the industry that there's so much research out there that it's very hard to sum up quickly. Um, this is an interesting question. Doesn't tapping trees make holes in the vessels that would disturb the flow? And the, the answer is yes, right? You're um, creating a hole in the tree and that's actually creating production space. So those vessels coming down into the hole of the tap are what is draining sap for you to collect in your bucket. Um, or tubing system or however you're collecting it. Um, but what we do see is that because we're drilling um, for reference a five, I think I have a tap somewhere. I always have taps. Um, a five sixteenths hole into the tree. So like pretty small. Um, and so all the vessels around that hole are still functioning just fine. And then when you're getting that thaw up top, that water that is now sort of like traveling down the tree via the positive pressure, but also a bit of gravity doesn't really care that there's a hole in that vessel. It's still gonna drain out of it, um, if that makes sense. So you're disturbing the flow in some vessels, like those vessels aren't necessarily gonna uptake water. It'll uptake water to the point of that hole, but it won't take it all the way up the tree anymore, but it's still going to like be a, a pathway for sap in the tree. Um, and Kate, we have about five more minutes maybe uh, to do yeah. this larger panel. And so maybe if you want to select some of the questions that might be best for the panel, and I know that you at least mentioned yeah. have five or 10 minutes to stay on and we could try to answer the rest of them if we can mm -hmm. after we do a couple slides for closing in about five, five or six minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I have 728 written down. But yeah, actually, if we could um, maybe do like 726 or something, and then yeah. I'll, and we'll come back to questions. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is a good one for the panelists. What would you recommend to a beginner as far as timing for when to start and what supplies you need? So my biggest suggestion is starting small. Um, and kind of growing with your hobby, whether it's a hobby or with your business. Um, so there's a lot, if you look at a maple catalog, there's a lot of bells and whistles that you can have, um, but you don't necessarily need that to make good quality syrup. Mm -hmm. I think that 
the first thing you should focus on is how you're going to process the sap that you collect. It's super easy to go out into the woods and start drilling holes in trees and putting taps in. But then when you're starting to get those um, larger sap flows, how are you gonna process all that? If it's just a turkey cooker, or do you, are you gonna make like a barrel stove or something? So start at the back end and figure out how you're gonna process the sap first before you tap the trees. Don't try to do it on your stove in the house. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a lot of ways to do it out there, but uh, I agree with Rachel on that one. It makes quite the mess. <laughs> uh, this one specifically for Missy. Besides giving those trees more sun and room, did you do anything else to get the huge trunk growth? We did not. Uh, we had a problem with the emerald ash borer, so we had to go in and harvest those trees before um, before we they were dead and we could still get. Um, some sort of economic value from them. So all we did was just take a lot of those stems, um, the ash, and then we did have to cut some maple, some hickory, and just kind of open them up. Um, I will say this, we did lose three maple trees from opening up the canopy, just too much sun kind of came on them and we killed those three and we've lost two due to wind. Um, we have a lot of problems with wind. So our stocking numbers are still high, but we need that so we don't lose a lot more trees to windfall. Um, if you look at any um, of the forestry models, it will tell you you're supposed to have so many stems per acre, but we have to kind of be above that. So all we did was just harvest the trees, uh, open up the canopies, and they kind of took off growing on their own, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, this one is interesting. It's a little uh, different. What do you recommend for closing a tap at the end of the season? And can you use the same tap site on the trunk next year? So you don't need to do anything. Mother Nature takes care of that tap hole itself. It's pretty neat if you go out a couple of weeks, months later, and it's scabbed over just like a human body heals its skin. The tree will heal, heal itself. Um, and then what was the second part? Um, can you use the same tap hole next year? No, you shouldn't. I'll let Brittany or Missy talk more about that. I might have to run my little ones crying right now. So mm -hmm. Papa's having um, a hard time. Papa's having a hard time. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Rachel, thank, thank you so Rachel. much. Rachel. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'll pick up there. And um, so just remember when you're when you're tapping, um, wherever there's a tap hole, um, up and down their saps like 12 inches up 12 inches down the sap's not going to flow again so you want to use those practices where you're you're moving over and then up and down um so the idea is when you're doing that by the time you get around the tree everything will be healed well it's going to heal faster than that but you're going to have that new growth and new space to tap um a really great resource um, would be Proctor Maple and Abby Vandenberg. She um, put out a paper and has some work on non-conductive wood, and it will explain more of what Brittany was talking about with that um, that scar that's in the tree. And Kate mentioned that as well. But that's a great resource to tell you more about staying away from last year's tap holes and how to um, go around the tr tree tapping each year for that growth when you come back around to that same side. So. Yeah. And that's also on mapleresearch.org if you guys are trying to find it. Um, I think we're about out of time on this. Uh, I'll stay on late later, as Katie said, and work through some more questions. But um, Brittany and Missy, do you guys just want to remind people the name of your farm and where you're located? Missy, if you want to, yeah. Sorry, I thought we both clicked unmute. Um, so it's Laurel Fork Sapsucker Sugar Camp. Uh, we are in Highland County, Virginia. Uh, elevation is 4,000 feet there, but we are right on the West Virginia border um, as well. So um, we would love to have any of you come visit. Have any questions um, directly for me, uh, go ahead and send those to Kate and, and she'll get in touch with me. But thank you all for showing up this evening. Um, really appreciate your enthusiasm. And if you are tapping this year, I wish you the best of luck. So. 
Um, again, Brittany with Family Roots Farm, and we're in the northern panhandle um, of West Virginia, so right between Ohio and Pennsylvania. And I've enjoyed spending my evening with you all, and I hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. Um, I did see one qu comment on food safety, and I have to just touch base real quick on that. Um, so my background is um, a sanitarian, so food safety special like specialist. So there, um, it's going to vary so much from state to state, and let alone when you're in the state, it can vary from county to county. So just educating yourself on what's out there. If you're in West Virginia, um, there is a maple. I mean, you can use it. Any anyone's welcome to use it. It's on um, West Virginia Maple Producers Association site, and it, and it was designed to make food safety not scary, and that anyone can. It's a lot of things that you're already doing, um, but it's just putting it in that formal language of standard operating procedures. So just know that resource is out there um, for you all. And again, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be on the panel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, then, thank you, Kate. Um, do you mind if I share a couple slides and then pass it no, back? I, I was just going to do a plug for Rachel since she had to run real quick. Oh, uh, yeah, that's the, a great the idea. The last panelist yeah. who had to run to take care of her little one um, is Rachel Taylor from Frostmore Farm in Pocahontas, West Virginia, or Pocahontas County, West Virginia, right between Frost and Dunmore. Another excellent place to visit if y'all are in the area. Great, thanks, Kate. Um, and we just wanna give y'all a quick reminder, there are more NTFPs that we're gonna be covering, ramps, fungi, ginseng, and golden seal and other NTFPs as well. And Margaret's put that information in the chat. I'll be able to do that again, just where you can get that information to sign up. Also, we want to invite you to um, connect with the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. You can become a member free of cost and access the, the resources and stay in the loop. And Margaret just put that in the chat as well. And there's a bunch of social media and YouTube videos. And I also want to plug in um, Sarah Jackson and Stesha Warren made a guide of all the intro materials on uh, maple production. And I put that link in the chat and I can put it back in there again, but that was in the forest farming and focus page. It's the pre-webinar PDF. So there are a bunch of resources there that are intro materials. Um, again, further questions, reach out to Kate and Kate will connect to the panelists. Kate also put future.edu-maple as a resource in there. And uh, we want to invite you to also share your feedback with us on the session tonight and any other um, feedback you have to share. We'd love to hear it. We have a real quick survey and just want to kind of end this, this, this uh, formal session and we'll continue on to the, whatever questions we can answer, but just want to give gratitude to Kate Photos for pulling together these great panelists and tending these relationships and learning about these products, just doing research on your own and formally. It's, we had so many folks in the, in the chat saying how enthusiastic you were presenting this information and there was lots of gratitude there. And also have gratitude to the speakers tonight, Brittany, Missy and Rachel for taking time to share their expertise and their experience. So I um, just want to invite you to, to use the chat feature to share any gratitudes, feedback there too um, for the speakers before we all hop off um, for the evening. And um, say goodnight. But um, Kate, I know that you mentioned you'd be up for doing a couple more questions. I will stop my share screen. And um, of course, any Brittany is still on. Brittany, if you're wanting to hang out, you're welcome to answer questions too, but that's not required by any means. Uh, we hope to be able to get a few more of these answered, but we won't be able to get to them all. So Kate, feel free to take it and maybe um, pull a couple that you think would be especially uh, helpful to have recorded uh, before we end the session tonight. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, oh, this one's very quick, um, but here I'll, I'll click answer live. Um, healthy tapping depth, if you guys are out there and starting up on your own, um, it's about two inches. We say inch and a half, two inches is where you should be drilling into. And um, it's helpful to put a stop on your drill bit so you don't end up going too deep. Um, but often, uh, newer folks tend to tap too deeply. So 
it's a good thing to know. Um, and then it is really tapping. Don't drive those spouts all the way in. You want that production space behind the tap. There's a lot of questions in here on raw sap products. Uh, so there is such thing. You can find them at like Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, that kind of store, um, health food stores where it's like tree water. Um, it is really sap. I didn't mean to put, I just put quotations around it because I call it sap and they call it tree water. Um, but uh, the issue is pasteurization. So as uh, the panelists were talking and specifically, um, I think Brittany and Rachel, you guys were talking about it a lot of um, sanitation. It's because of that, um, there is like natural, naturally occurring bacteria and yeast in the sap, right? It's a product of the woods. There's things out there. Um, and so if you don't pasteurize your sap, it will ferment, uh, which can also lead to some fun products, but not necessarily what you wanted to do if you're trying to sell it as like water. Um, a lot of people are carbonizing it or carbonating it to sort of give it a little extra um, oomph, but it's out there, um, which is interesting. Oh, here's sort of a, a bigger question. How has global warming affected production? Global warming, um, climate change, whatever you wanna call it, the world getting, where we live getting a little bit warmer every year um, affects production in a lot of different ways. It's uh, really pushed the maple syrup industry to start looking at how to deal with warmer temperatures during maple season. Um, it's pushed maple season back in the year. People are tapping earlier um, than ever before, but um, it's really affected it in a lot of ways uh, because it has such like far reaching effects on the climate of where we live. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, I could write a thesis on it. It would, it's a really complicated relationship between climate and maple production. Um. Oh, Brittany, are you still here? There's one for you in the Q and A. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, have you guys seen? Well, I guess. Um, have you guys seen a a big shift in production since you guys have been making syrup for a pretty? good number of years on your, on the same property? Um, so it's, a for us, um, we're just now starting to tap on our, our homesteaded farm. Um, so the homestead farm had a young maple grove and, you know, when we first got into making maple syrup, it wasn't, there wasn't enough taps there to make it worth our while. Um, but, you know, through forest management, we're now able to tap that. So as far as farm specific records for maple syrup, um, we don't, we don't really know that answer. Yeah, it's, um, there's some other producers in this area who've been tapping for a lot of years and, uh, a lot of times they've seen good years, bad years throughout their time tapping. Um, I think there is sort of a general consensus that people are tapping a bit earlier than they used to. Um, okay, there's a question about RO system. So reverse osmosis is sort of a newer introduction to the syruping industry. Um, if you're familiar with it, it's often from water purification side of things. Um, and so what it's doing is in water purification, you're pushing water, uh, you're pushing contaminated water under pressure through a semi-permeable permeable membrane. So what's coming out the other side is pure water. Um, in the water world, people want that pure water. In the maple world, we want that now like concentrated sap. Um, so when you push sap against it, all the sugar molecules get stuck on the outside of the membrane. Um, so you can take, 2% sap up to like 8% sugar before it ever hits heat. Now, um, it, for most, for basically all producers in the Southern tier, it does not actually 
take away any of the benefits of the flavor you get from heat because people are ROing it to like maximum like 16% sugar. Um, interestingly enough, in Quebec, people were experimenting with high power RO and they were ROing their sap up to like 35% sugar. And they actually really did see a decrease in um, flavor. They were making pretty much like flavorless, ma flavorless maple syrup um, because it wasn't spending enough time on the heat. Uh, one producer I work with um, said that they think 12 percent's the magic number. Um, I don't know. Brittany, how high do you guys, you guys RO, right? Yeah, we use an RO, um, which comes back to record keeping. So my dad is the main sugar maker of the family and he's kind of old fashioned in a sense. So you'll hear maple producers talk about um, like RO syrup. So if you tend to pass the maple syrup through the RO, you know, several times, you're going to get a different flavor of maple syrup. So we pass ours, the most we take it to is like a 6%, occasionally 8%. Um, but we feel that it does affect the flavor once you start taking more out. Mm -hmm. Here's a good one for you, Brittany. Um, what do you think are the most important points of educating consumers about this amazing NTFP? non-timber forest product. Thanks for catching me up to speed there because I was trying to think of that acronym. <laughs> There's always so many. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the most common questions that we are asked when we're selling um, is, do you have a sugar-free option? And we don't. I mean, this is 100% pure. It's 100% all natural. We're not adding anything to it we're not really so connecting people to like it's you know from the tree to to your plate and just filling in the gaps with some basic education of what we can get um naturally from our from our trees and from our land is the foundation i think for the education yeah i would i would agree um, as, as all the producers were saying tonight, like a lot of people start the conversation by asking when you add the sugar. Um, so uh, oh, here's kind of an interesting one. Are there local or regional support systems that can help individual producers? Um, and I would say look up your closest association. Um, I know West Virginia and I think Virginia's is in the making, but we don't really care about state boundary all that much. Um, and it's often a good place to start to meet other producers and find some resources. Um, you got any other suggestions, Brittany? And just like um, familiarizing yourself with your local food systems um, and the organizations that are are working to support local foods. Um, you know, right now there's lots of um, restaurants searching for maple syrup or for local goods. So, you know, when you're looking at a restaurant and trying to sell your maple syrup for them to use, there's a big price difference, right? So um, a way that we market it is you can give them like a two ounce cup um, and when we show them the value that it costs for a two ounce cup, it, they usually f find that it's worth it and they could adjust their prices maybe by 25 cents. And now they're supporting a local business. So building those relationships and working together, um, we have a great restaurant that uses our syrup, um, the Vagabond in Wheeling. And through that, in Wheeling, there's also a public market. So we all work together to send customers. Um, and the public market has a lot of other farms as well. So just driving that support local. Mm -hmm. And don't forget about ABFFC. They're a good place to start to for support. Um, I, would, I would also say, I mean, um, Local foresters 
I mean, uh, you're like state foresters, they're often mostly trained in timber, but there are some that are starting to expand their knowledge range. Um, but also they're a good place to start if you really don't know what kinds of trees are on your property. Um, they're, they're not, that's a good place to start. And then again, reach out. I'm always happy to help um, in whatever way I can, um, it, even if it's just connecting you with other people closer to you, but happy to help. <laughs> Um. Yeah, okay, maybe we can take uh, one, one or two more questions and then wrap it up and get the recording out to folks so they can maybe hear, hear them if they weren't able to tune in. Mm -hmm. Um, we're starting to get to some like nitty gritty stuff. Uh, oh, somebody was asking about- Hi, Brittany. Videos. Thanks so much. Mm hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone was asking about videos and it's it's really YouTube is full of them. Um, look for reputable sources, though, like UVM Proctor has a lot. Future Generations has a lot. Um, Cornell has a lot. But if, if you go go the YouTube route, there's a lot out there. But just check the source when you watch them, because there's also a lot of like Homesteader, which is both great because it shows you how you can do it on a really small scale, but the, the science is not always correct. Um, so just maybe sprinkle both in is my one, one suggestion out there. I think a lot of these, I'm, I'm gonna start getting into the nitty gritty, Katie, and I, I'm not sure we need to go there tonight. That sounds good, Kate. Thank you so much for uh, going through these questions. I know that we weren't able to answer them all, but I think we got a good a good sampling and uh, folks know where to go for more resources. So I really appreciate you pulling together this panel tonight and sharing the presentation as well. And just want to thank Margaret again for being back up uh, to host tonight and our sponsors as well. Here, let's uh, pull Margaret in here, bring you in the spotlight. Hey, Margaret. Hey. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for, for making it possible all around. And thank you, Katie, for being a great MC and organizer and everything. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll um, have, have our next events available if anybody wants to tune in. So look forward to seeing everybody uh, throughout the series. And Kate, I'll follow up later. Folks are asking about the slides if you're up for sharing those. Oh, and yeah. Um, I'll send them to you as like a PDF. Oh yeah. You can already actually send them to me and I can make a PDF 